Thank you everyone for taking part in this uh, valuable conversation uh, that we're having today on African-American, Black and Puerto Rican Latino course of studies. I just wanna go over quickly in uh, the format of this uh, conversation meeting. Um, first of all, that this, uh, this meeting is uh, being sponsored by CERC in the Connecticut State Department of Education. And uh, we also want to let you know the format of, the, of this conversation uh, is that you're going not to use the chat box, please raise your hands or use the question and answer uh, component of, of this webinar so we could answer your question more uh, clearly and in, in, a, in, a, in a timely fashion. So, let me just begin with the agenda. Let me begin with the history of the legislation, which is Connecticut Public Act 19-12, uh, which passed in June of 2019. Uh, first of all, this was uh, started with the uh, caucus of the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus at the State Legislative that began this process. The process was to begin with the law for K-12 for this type of uh, teaching of uh, Black and African American and Puerto Rican Latino studies at all uh, elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, then it went to 912, and of course, this is it passed as an elective for 912 at this time. Uh, also, uh, CERC was written into the legislation um, to coordinate and work along with the Connecticut State Department of Education on uh, uh, developing the curriculum. And most of all, this is a first integrated model state curriculum um, that you have that we have developed. This is, again, I have said it's an elective full year course. In other words, it is a one semester African-American Black uh, curriculum. And the second semester, it is Puerto Rican Latino curriculum. So we have one full year of this course. I also want to say that the law also wanted to integrate both curriculum. So this is that this is important to know, uh, in that in it's a whole year. Also, it has a semester focus, like I have mentioned. One semester it will be African American Black, and the other semester will be Latino Puerto Rican. It it has ten comprehensive units of studies, and also it has a two prong inquiry base that. Uh, Two prong inquiry base is one is content knowledge, and the second is a identity component to it, and it is and, and it needs to be offered in 2021 2022. And the key word here is may be offered in 2021, but in 2022 and in 2023 it must be offered. So that's th just to clear that component. And Michelle, I don't know if you want to add more to it. Gladys, that was perfect. Thank you so much. Gladys Lavis is the Director of um, Equity at the State Department of Education. So thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, welcome everyone and good morning. My name is Michelle LeBron Griffin and I'm a consultant for the State Education Resource Member. Uh, resource center, excuse me, and a member of the CERC team of five um, that is with us today. I'm just going to talk briefly about the curriculum and development process that we engaged in um, over the course of the past year. Last November of 2019, we launched our advisory group. Um, we actually invited um, a variety of stakeholders from across the state. Um, and those of you have, who have done curriculum development work will appreciate um, this large group because, um, you know, 
Typically it's 20 to 25 or 12 to 15 members who are working over the course of a couple of years together. Um, but it was that important that we had not only educators and experts, um, but we had higher ed involvement. We had historians and scholars involved, um, community museum representatives, parents and students. And so um, you'll see on our website, which we'll post in a moment, um, who those members are and the organizations that they represent. Those members were then organized into nine committees. Um, about 60 people are also fulfilling the responsibilities of the committees and we began with research and analysis, trying to discover what actually exists in relation to this curricula within the state of Connecticut, what is being taught at the various high schools, and then we went out into the national um, perspective. And so we conducted a high school curriculum survey first. We had over 300 responses, um, 200 and about 15 or so from actual frontline teachers, 62% who said that they were ready to implement this course um, and excited to receive the curriculum resources and the professional learning to implement with fidelity. Uh, we also from that high school curriculum survey received from approximately 17 high schools across the state who are implementing some semblance of an African course of studies or a Latino course of studies, um, whether, whether it be a full year or a half semester, uh, excuse me, a half year course currently. And so they shared different artifacts, products and materials with us that we could learn and build from. But there was no uh, high school in the state of Connecticut at that time that was implementing an integrated course. And that led us to look at the national level. And also we saw there's about seven to eight other states in the nation who are implementing or legislating African studies or Latino studies more again on the African American side. Um, but no, no state in uh, the nation that is implementing an integrated course. So this was um, something that Connecticut had no precedence for. And so then we began from obviously that <clears throat> curriculum work that already had been started in each of the community areas that was identified. We then led into focus groups to see what our community of educators uh, family members and students were interested in being sure that this course entailed and included. And so we ran approximately 12 uh, focus groups. We had one that we were able to host in person uh, in the beginning of March at Torrington High School. We had anticipated running courses, uh, excuse me, focus groups regionally. But with the pandemic, we then had to move into a virtual format that actually allowed us to have uh, more participation, participation from more students because we were able to target specific uh, youth groups across uh, the state. And then what was really unique is then we also, instead of regional participation, we were then able to actually have Bridgeport talking to Franklin and Avon talking to Trumbull um, in these different groups. And so uh, really learning about the different perspectives across the state. The other um, thing that came out of the focus group in regards to a common theme uh, was, was twofold. One, they wanted to be certain that they learned about their history. So students were saying, learning things about my own culture, about my own ancestry, about the contributions of my um, forefathers to this country. And then the second thing was learning about some of the positive contributions, some of the assets, some of the pride that goes along with his or her culture and identity. And so um, not only was it important, obviously, for our historians and scholars to be sure that the content delivery was accurate, but it was also important to our communities and our parents and our students that that content knowledge supported them in their identity development. Thus, you have the two-pronged approach. That then led into infrastructure supports, recognizing that there will be um, a lot that will need to go along with a course like this. And you'll be hearing a little bit more about that um, in the presentation this morning from State Department consultant Stephen Armstrong. So I'll hold on that. 
And then that led into the core syllabus work and the core syllabus committee actually worked on the course description and the excerpt for the program of studies that was sent to each of you in the memo from the State Department of Education and CERC, as well as the learning objectives and essential questions. Uh, that description and the learning objectives and essential questions actually framed the development of our units of study that the content development committees began in their work. We had two content development committees. One was African American studies and one was Puerto Rican Latino studies. Those two committees developed the 10 to 11 units as Gladys described. And now we are moving into what we're calling the integration and assessment review committee. That committee will ensure that the standards that have been identified from the Connecticut social studies framework are aligned with obviously the units and their scaffolding and spiraling between the two two semesters, and then ultimately the assessments that go across both semesters and the culminating activities. So there is a lot of project-based learning that is um, part of the units of study for this course. And so it's important that all of that aligns across the two semesters. We also had um, some discussions with the Publications and Dissemination Committee. Uh, this spring, a lot of the availability of resources will be electronic as there's a new platform that the State Department is um, undergoing at this time that will also in the future allow us to engage in uploading various lessons that have been reviewed. So that's a very exciting um, new piece. And then finally, that uh, the professional learning plan. That is not something that was part of um, CERC's Connecticut legislation, but it was important because from the um, initial focus groups, we kept hearing from the survey that I mentioned earlier from teachers, we kept hearing the importance of and the value for and the need uh, for the professional learning to implement a course like this would be um, very necessary. And so we have a proposed plan um, that hasn't yet been officially adapted or calendared, um, if you will, but uh, we will talk again a little bit more about that in the presentation. Finally, we gathered an expert review panel. There were 10 members, eight of which were from out of state or the national perspective. These were experts in both African American studies as well as Puerto Rican Latino studies. Uh, you can again go to the website to see who those members were. Um, but in um, or short or in brief, um, one of the members from the Center of Puerto Rican Studies from CUNY had mentioned to us upon review of the units that were still in draft form, um, the potential of this course to actually be a national model. So we were very excited about all of the work uh, the very hard work of our advisory group members in developing and presenting um, such a prestigious course, such a comprehensive course. And I'm excited to show you uh, the draft course outline that looks like this. As Gladys had mentioned, semester one is African American history and semester two is Puerto Rican Latino history. Across the six units um, of semester one, it's more chronological thematic or chrono thematic. And semester two in Puerto Rican studies, it is more um, thematic. The reason and purpose for that is because there is a lot of spiraling back into um, the semester one content. And there's also going back to that project-based focus, a lot more um, accumulation of knowledge and application of knowledge over time. I'm going to invite my colleague, Paquita Jarman-Smith um, to introduce herself and speak to some of the work of the African-American Black Content Development Committee. And so Paquita, if you'll just allow me to just pause and go out to the unit of study sample. Good morning, everyone. I'm Paquita Jarman-Smith. I'm a consultant at CERC, and I am liaison for the African-American Content Committee, the Course Syllabus Committee, and the Publication and Dissemination Committee. I'm really honored to be able to share with you a sneak peek of Semester 1, Unit 2. We had an awesome group of historians, teachers, um, community members to help us support this work. Um, this unit of study is about um, the hard topic of slavery, but we wanted to share our perspective on slavery through the strengths 
and the resiliencies of the people who fought for freedom and justice. For example, you'll see how this unit um, outlines what students will know and be able to do. It's aligned to the Connecticut Elementary Social Studies framework and our standards for ELA, for English language learners, identity. And of course, these are the course objectives. Reimagining new possibilities, especially when you're thinking about the perspective of people who were enslaved. So students will examine, analyze, and investigate, as we said, in inquiry-based <coughs> approaches. We also have the um, opportunity for, for our students to have their own self-discoveries their own identity development. So in this unit, they will engage in analysis of the institution of slavery in Connecticut, the Caribbean and the Americas and, it, and its impact on African-Americans in the past as well as through time. This is a robust um, curriculum. So we start out with a pre-assessment poll so that we can find out what our students know about local and global history of African-Americans of that time. And now Michelle is scrolling up to the actual lesson plan sequence. Um, so the first start from this, this um, unit is going to be talking about agency and resistance in the Caribbean and Spanish America. Um, they will understand that in the early 1500s, there was a group in Spanish Florida who fought for freedom um, and understand who those characters were and what their lives meant. Um, so just so that you know in the backdrop, we want students to know that there were people who resisted from the very beginning. There were people who were part of um, the discoveries from, from Spain where people were just on voyages, finding out about new places and explorers as well. And those histories are included. So we'll just have them take a look at the first day. Two minute warning. Okay. So one of the first um, activities that we're going to have them go into is looking at a map that shows um, how people migrated throughout the Caribbean from Africa and different parts of the world. We're gonna talk about forced migration, emancipation, um, the atrocities that were um, traumatic for people who were enslaved at that time. Paquita, can I just ask that you also speak about the home links and the extension activities? Home leagues and are designed to have students affirm their identities, whoever they are in their race, ethnicities. So we have questions and we imagine that with this course that students will have their own reflections about identity. So this one, we're asking them to, to um, discuss what you learn about African-Americans with a family member and your ideas for learning about other experiences of people who were free or enslaved during that time and for them to reflect on how their, their thinking has changed. And then you'll also see that there's interdisciplinary integration as well as extensions and experiential activities to go beyond um, obviously the four walls of the classroom. Did you talk to them about the what we mean by three days? No, how you can go, you can go ahead and do that. Um, we typically um, put our days as either a 45 minute block or a 90 minute block. So if you see a day, correct me if I'm, that's, that's, we're talking about 45 minutes. Yes. 
And so um, these are uh, the sample unit that was presented here. You saw it went up the first lesson went across a couple of days. Again, those are projected. Um, and of course, those schools that are implementing in a block schedule or in a 90 minute format would actually obviously be able to do two of those lessons within one class time. Um, you saw Paquita mentioned that uh, we do uh, ground all of the units in the social studies frameworks. We are using the UBD process, even though it's been expanded a little with the home links idea, the extension activities, the scaffolding in synchronous and asynchronous settings. Uh, we did mention that it was developed by not only educators, but experts in these content areas and has been reviewed by an advisory group uh, through a cyclical process. Um, anything that the committees developed went back to advisory group for feedback and input. The expert review panel and now currently it is being reviewed by the State Department's Academic Standards and Assessment Committee. It is in draft form um, so that we uh, state this to you. It is not yet available for public dissemination or use. We know that you are all chomping at the bit and very excited, probably even more so by what Paquita has just presented to you, um, but it will be available if not sooner, but legislatively by July of 2021. We also want you to know that with the um, proposed coursework that we also are thinking of implementation considerations. And so just as Paquita was just men mentioning, there's projected timeframes for the units and lessons, but we wanna actually know what happens on the ground within that initial implementation year of 2021-22. Legislators have actually suggested that that be a field study year to actually um, support teachers with their implementation, but also supporting the evolution of the curriculum hearing from teachers and students and families and community members, staff members who are on the front line in regards to um, the course uh, sequence, uh, the course impact, uh, the course um, progression and um, those types of, of things, we wanna be sure that we get that feedback on. We also mentioned the comprehensive professional learning plan. Uh, the proposed plan includes a orientation, um, a training institute, again, not only securing and supporting teachers in the development of their content knowledge, recognizing these are social studies teachers who are most familiar with the inquiry-based approach, but also supporting youth in some of the conversations that will be developed and naturally um, and authentically part of the learning process. We want to be sure that teachers are prepared for that. And so in addition to that training, there will also be networking and coaching opportunities uh, regionally and also at the school level. Um, we've talked a little bit about there being um, a central resourcing for book bundles for each school. And so the thought behind that is really to reduce the burden for purchasing to um, increase the, the quality uh, quantity discount um, that might be um, available to a, a large percentage, obviously, of, of schools for purchasing um, that number of uh, books, you will get a larger discount at the state level. And so the books, <clears throat> there are no not necessarily a, a required text for this course or books that students will be required to read from cover to cover. Uh, there's a lot of electronic and digital resources available to us, but any of the books that will be um, offered to each school will be more reference points for teachers, um, reference points for teachers to utilize with students in close reads. Um, information, again, that could be utilized by all staff for a common um, you know, book to learn more about in order to support this course and the pathways to learning over time. We've also had conversation about the development of a speakers bureau. Um, as Bequita was mentioning, we, we worked with such great people in this advisory group and there's many others across the state. Um, again, historians and at the higher ed level who we wanna bring right to the classroom. And so whether that's through a archived recording or whether that's through uh, you and actually inviting a speaker to a classroom live or again in the virtual space and doing some inter-district or inter-high school um, collaborations. 
to support some of the um, multiple perspectives and engagement um, around this course. So that is another option that is being proposed. The lesson repository you heard me speak of earlier, you saw in Paquita's description, it certainly gives teachers all of the resources they need uh, to develop quality and engaging lessons, but the actual plans themselves based on the students and based on the community um, will be at the uh, responsibility of the classroom teacher. And so the professional development will concentrate a lot around that in regards to supporting teachers with the lesson development um, and then obviously the feedback on those lessons to go into a repository for teachers to utilize across the state so that's very exciting. The home links Paquita mentioned as well as the interdisciplinary and extension activities so thank you Paquita. I'm now going to introduce Stephen Armstrong from the State Department of Education and he's going to go over some of the recommended infrastructures. Sure thank you very much. Um, first off, uh, getting buy-in in your school is, you know, and, and I would emphasize strongly being somewhat, being fairly directly involved in the process, whether you're teaching in, um, wherever you're teaching in Connecticut, I can guarantee you that this class will be valuable for your kids. So this is a valuable course. This is not just a course that will benefit certain kids. This will be a course that will benefit all kids. And as you're, you know, and, and I know from working in schools that sometimes a first year elective in some schools, it's hard to build. But this one I think should be fairly easy to build, you know, because these, this course would discuss, sure, it's gonna be about history, but it's also gonna be about contemporary social events that, uh, that, 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 that students are reading about and per, in some cases participating in right now. I think it's important to get the guidance counselors involved in the, um, in, in the planning, in, in, in the getting kids into the course. And uh, I, I think it's really a course that, that can build. I mean, if, if your school is going to do, uh, if your school has any interest in doing social justice, and I know, virtually every school is, that this class could have a, 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 a critical role in that. A question, that, and, and a couple questions here that are oftentimes at, first off, if you're in the social studies world, and if you know inquiry and instruction, and if you know the inquiry arc, you're gonna be well suited to teach this course because this course, a lot of the activities of this course are very, very inquiry-based and are directly based on the inquiry arc, using the inquiry arc. So to prepare the person or persons who are gonna teach this, regardless of the content, regardless of, of, of any specific content requirements, I would suggest that you make sure that the people teaching this course know inquiry because that's a process that's gonna be important as they move forward. Um, a couple things about who might be in the course, what students might be in the course. Um, you know, um, different schools have different rules about who can be in electives. I mean, I've worked in schools where electives were only for juniors and seniors. Um, we would probably recommend that it's good that a student have his or her U.S. history course first to build off, and then this course would build off that. So we would strongly, probably fairly strongly suggest that whenever a kid takes this, it would be after their U.S. history course. However, if your school rules state that a kid can take, or if you can have exceptions, and there's kids that this would that this course would value in their say freshman year or sophomore year, go for it. But again, probably the background in US history is helpful. As was mentioned before, um, this is, and this is not something that anybody's made up. This is part of the legislation that this is going to be a full year elective course. Um, I know that I've talked to some administrators and some teachers who were going to say, ask the question, can they take half of it one year, the other half another year, or something like that. 
And the requirement is that can't be done. And so a kid that's going to take this, it's going to be a full year elective course. Um, again, I understand that in some cases, this there will be some kids that can't take it for that reason. I know in some schools that um, you know that 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 it's hard to fit electives in, but this is to repeat myself the requirement for that course. Um, uh, there was a couple questions yesterday. Could this re replace U.S. history in a student's, um, you know, in, in student social studies requirements? That decision would be made completely at the district level. That would not be a decision that would be come from any from anywhere else. As far as staffing, uh, you know, oh, a question that sometimes people have asked. It, it, the legislation states that you, a district, a high school, has to offer the course. It does not say that the high school has to specifically run the course. And what I mean by that is if you have at your school a requirement that no class runs under 10 kids, you have to have 10 kids to run a class. And purely for the sake of argument, this class gets five. Um, let's say that there, the school is not to required to run it. However, let's find ways in that situation to, to find things for those kids to do. Some schools, I'm not suggesting this, but a couple of schools have talked about cross school. You know, somebody teaches it at one school and the Zoom class is offered at the other school. Some schools have offered about, you know, hey, let's have, um, you know, let's do independent study. And there are options, but I, if a kid is interested, I would really hope, and we can talk to you about some options if there's, if there's enough kids signing up. Who should teach this? You know, if you're a department leader or a school administrator or a curriculum coach, you probably know who the person is in the social studies department that's best to teach this. You know, it should be somebody, you know, content knowledge is important, but I, I think what's as, as important as content knowledge is going to be somebody that's going to be able to come in and lead courageous conversations, to lead difficult conversations on race. I, in my personal opinion, that's just as important as what the teacher knows about African-American and Latino history. And by the way, there will be professional development in both the content of these courses and there will be professional development on how to lead those type of conversations as well. Another way to, to broaden who teaches this, some schools are talking about having it be team taught. Um, and the, the combination could be whoever you want, but it's just the person that, is the person who's to teach this probably isn't necessarily, although it could be the person who knows most about the subject matter. It's gotta be about somebody that can really um, lead discussions with kids. Um, I think it just so you know, and this is another question, is that there is, um, a, there is a curriculum as, as Paquita and Michelle have mentioned, that's had a lot of work going into it. The legislation states that you have to use this curriculum as your base. So there's no, there's no getting around that, that you, this curriculum that's being produced is the curriculum. The legislation states this, that will guide the teaching of this course in every district. Now, like any curriculum, can a local district do some, uh, can, would work within the framework of that curriculum? You know, that you would create some local activities, some local engagement, you know, some local things. But the point being, that's in the context of the la larger curriculum that's being created. Into the, um, in into the back to inquiry, just for a second. I, I would remind you that know it, that the last 
dimension of the inquiry arc, the fourth dimension, talks about taking informed action. And, and, and this is not, and, and that can take various forms, but we desperately don't want this just to be a course where kids learn stuff. That we want whenever and wherever possible that kids take what they learned in the class and somehow impact either their school, their community, their family, that there's a wider impact to the stuff in this class than just what they learned in the classroom. And I think that's a, a real, real important part of this class. Michelle? Thank you so much, Stephen. I would just add a couple of things. Uh, one, as uh, just kind of piggybacking off the inquiry arc, there was a question in the um, question and answers about uh, access to this course. And yes, in the lesson activities, as Stephen is describing, there is a variety of scaffolding that is available, not only for a learner possibly with a disability, but also for English learners or whose English is not their first language. And so those considerations have been um, provided for. Also thinking about this course not sitting as a standalone elective, but something that is actually part of a pathway of learning of ethnic studies or a pathway of work towards the portrait of a graduate competencies, including civic mindedness, including critical consciousness, um, critical inquiry. And so thinking about what that might look like within the school is something that I hope all high schools will be engaging in now, even though you may not be an implementer until 22, 23, to support, um, again, the teachers who will be implementing this, um, but also this, the youth who will be participating in this course as they will be very excited, as Stephen has mentioned, um, with the current context or the contemporary context of how a lot of what they're learning is applying to the real world. So the relevance will be very heightened and strong. And so they will be wanting to engage in those conversations outside of that 45 minute or 90 minute class. And so that's where we talk about that shared responsibility. Um, we don't know if budgets will be able to afford, obviously, a full-time co-taught class, but there's no reason why if there's, um, you know, interdisciplinary connections of what's being read in, you know, English literacy class, um, and that, you know, teacher is coming in for a lesson or a combined um, uh, unit uh, that is, again, uh, co-taught. So, all, all different types of options to explore. Um, as Stephen mentioned, we're very excited about how much the advisory group has considered all of these um, implementation and infrastructure needs. So please don't think that it hasn't been thought of already. Um, please be sure that you contact the State Department um, to explore uh, what, what implementation might look like in a large high school or even a very small high school. And don't forget, if I could just say one more thing, Michelle, don't mm -hmm. forget that, you know, not everybody that teaches this in every high school, I'll be, let's be honest, not everybody that teaches this in every high school in, a, in Connecticut is going to be an expert on the first day of the content knowledge. I can assure you that we're going to have great professional development on this. And, but, but, but secondly, is, as was mentioned twice, there will be a speakers bureau. There will be resources. So this is not gonna be a course where, hey, here's the curriculum, go get them. Is there's gonna be some real active ways that you're, you and your teachers can talk to other teachers use doing this course. There'll be speakers that can come to your school. So um, this, we really see this in the, in the next year and especially the year after that as a year of continuous conversations between CERC, the Connecticut State Department of Ed, and you guys out in the field. So at this point, we're going to engage in the question and answer. So if you could please provide your questions to us in the Q&A box, you can type them right in, or if you would prefer, you could use the raise hand feature and Wanda will assist us in being sure that all questions are responded to before the end of the session. 
So our first question is from Carmita Hodge. And Stephen, I'm going to direct this to you. Because there is no required text, do I understand correctly that any text can be purchased by individual schools? That is correct. And uh, that, that you're, Carmita, uh, that you are correct on that. And uh, to this, now, uh, to, to, to my knowledge that, and stop me when I'm wrong, Michelle, that, that materials will be provided, material will be suggested, but, um, but, but the textbook requirements, what, the, what schools buy is ultimately on them. Yes, so Stephen, I would, I would just add your, your inquiry-based approach that you mentioned, right? And, and it's our understanding that um, because it's an inquiry-based approach, you would want to have multiple references, multiple sources of information for students to be drawing from. And so that's one reason that there's not, you know, a cover to cover text because there's going to be multiple primary and secondary resources that are being used. Um, the other uh, reason in regards to a text is we do not currently have a text available <laughs> that speaks to African American, Black and Latino Puerto Rican um, history. So there um, certainly is Paul Ortiz's book. Um, Paul was actually a member of our expert review panel, but he in his book, which is a great book and a great reference, um, actually probably on the list of the book bundle that will be going to, you know, for teachers um, as a reference. Um, but it's more about the intersectionality in relation to our history. And um, the legislators have actually talked about maybe that's the part two course that comes, you know, after this introductory course where we actually talk about very in depth, the histories of both African American studies as well as Puerto Rican Latino studies. So um, there are districts and schools that have actually sought from Steve and I, uh, they put together, well, here's some recommendations that we want our department to read, or here's a recommendation um, we're making that our whole school community reads in preparation for this course. What do you think about these books? And Stephen and I have it said yes and yes, and also thought about um, offering, you know, a Latino suggestion or a black woman's history suggestion, right? So to kind of round out um, the references that are being um, selected. So please don't hesitate if you are doing your own research and thinking about what types of books might be utilized for your staff and or your student reference library, um, we'd be happy to, you know, weigh in on those decisions. Probably for the person teaching it, maybe the Ortiz book would be a good, a good place to start. This is not for the kids. This is for the teacher. Right. But again, to reiterate strongly what, what, what Michelle said, that book talks about African American history and Latino history in, in a mixed way. Our curriculum will not do that when we're actually working with the kids, first semester African-American, second semester Latino-American, Puerto Rican. So the next question is from E. Corso. Um, can, oh, I just lost it. Hold on one second. <laughs> can the course be offered as two half credit courses? And I'm going to be swift on that response. I see Gladys shaking her head. <laughs> the answer to that is no. This is a one credit full year course. I don't think we can say that too many times today. Um, and if it is separated, you will actually be reducing the integrity of the course. It is meant to be taught as an integrated course. There is spiraling of content across units as well as across semesters. And um, going back to what Steve said, it's legislatively um, required to be a full credit year long course. We recognize that will cause some difficulty in schedulings. Um, and so some things that Gladys has spoken about. So Gladys, maybe you wanna unmute here about the cautions of when you do have another singleton course about your ESL supports that, yeah. so maybe discussing some of those scheduling options here would be helpful. Sure, no, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yes, I, I was a high school principal for many years and did many years of scheduling. And I understand the challenges administrators have in, uh, in scheduling, especially what we call singletons uh, that are offered maybe once uh, during the day. 
And, and, and my caution is to make sure that if this, to take this course and, get, and try not to schedule it against another required course right back to back, because many then you may have less students taking it. And some students would love to take the course, but because the way it was scheduled, uh, they're not able to. Also, if I have, I want ELs to take the course, but if I'm going to schedule that a, a class that all the ELs must are uh, required to take, and then I'm going to put this course right next to it, then that is another problem because now those students cannot take the course. Uh, so I caution the way uh, the, the schedule is done, and that's something that really uh, you should have a conversation if, uh, if leaders are here in this uh, right now at this meeting, if they want to say, uh, give some ideas or if you're uh, talk to your administrator and make sure that really this doesn't occur as often. Uh, so we will have a better, uh, you know, students will be able to take the course as needed. So that's what I caution Michelle, the, uh, the schools to do. And another thing I would add, and I apologize, is that um, it, as, as, as you know, we have school improvement plans and we have goals for the year. I would also suggest to keep it in the forefront is that leaders, and if you're in the leadership team, please make sure that you have a goal and how, what strategies, how is scheduling going to inform the success of this course? That's all in that component uh, when you start writing up your goals as a, uh, uh, for the school. So that, that's why that's important because that also informs strategies and also scheduling. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. And uh, Robert Stevenson is also concerned about the full year implication. I, I just want to uh, stress that it's not that um, half year or 0.5 uh, course uh, considerations uh, were made. They were. But what we don't want to continue and what we are um, through this course, I hope you have heard, um, trying to really support students in their identity development. And um, we have many youth within our state who um, actually are biracial or represent more than two races. And so that exploration of their identity development being continuous and seamless within a single course is, is very important. Uh, we don't wanna continue the divisive nature. Um, some students taking African-American studies, some students taking Latino studies. We want all students, um, ultimately all students um, across all, all of the state and every high school taking this course ultimately, right? That is the vision of the K-12 curriculum over time. Um, so there have been uh, lots of conversation, Robert, in regards to recognizing the impact um, in scheduling and what that will mean. Um, and there's also been the conversation of how do we make this a course requirement um, to, or excuse me, a graduation requirement to alleviate uh, that, that concern. So uh, watch for further information, um, but do know it is not something that could be implemented in a semester by semester um, course. And, and could I just say one thing, Michelle, is that okay? Sure, we have a okay. few more um, questions, but go ahead. Yeah, very quickly, just remember that graduation requirements on what requirement is now are, are largely left to the state level, I mean, to the district level. So if you want to make this a required course in your district, feel free. But at this point, uh, the state is not take, the state of Connecticut Department of Ed is not doing that. Correct. So the professional development. This is a question from Gen Jennifer um, Beermunder. I'm sorry if I smashed your last name. Um, so Jennifer B. Uh, the professional development will be offered in summer or throughout the school year. And so the proposed plan. Um, again, nothing is set in stone or scheduled per the calendar yet. 
is that orientation for initial implementers may begin as soon as this spring with a summer institute and then some work obviously um, quarterly for each of the three unit um, rollouts. So um, we're very excited about the plan. It's comprehensive. It will follow the teachers throughout the full year. And then again, support the teachers in the 22-23 school year uh, in the same way. The text, um, Jennifer had a, a, another question in regards to the texts that are rep being referenced in the book bundles. We will get that list to you um, probably by the beginning of December. Uh, once we have uh, the collapse of all of the units of study and indexing and review with the State Department of Education, um, you know, what are the most um, important references for uh, your staff. Elizabeth Spencer is asking, in my district, U.S. history is offered June, oh, a bump, sorry, Wanda. In my district, U.S. history is offered junior year. It is recommended that students take U.S. history before this course, and then the course will then ultimately only be available for seniors. Subsequent courses in this area would not be an option then in our districts. Do you have any thoughts about this concern? Stephen, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, in a lot of schools, I think that's the way it's going to play out. If you have your U.S. history course, your junior, I mean, again, if you think as a district that there are kids that should take this before earlier in their career, in their academic career, there's nothing that's stopping you from doing that. It's just when our recommendation is logically, it would seem that U.S. history would be taken before this course. If, if you're offering U.S. history course in your junior year, I think an unfortunate of, a result of that, if you follow the recommendation about having U.S. history first, that would mean that most of the kids in that class in your school would be seen. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to move to Renita Crawford's question in preparation for next school year. Can you provide a course description encouraging students of all races and ethnicities to consider taking it? So very excitingly, Renita, um, the course description is drafted. I will ask Wanda to please um, put the link to the website uh, right on um, the chat for everybody. That course description is available currently as well as the excerpt for the program of studies that was written in a way um, you know, that would be motivating um, for, for any high school student. Also, Renita, there is a documentary of the curriculum development that is almost finished. We had anticipated having it for today, but it might look more like middle no November, right before um, Thanksgiving. Uh, we have what's called a documentary that you could utilize such uh, for a, a, like a public service announcement. You can utilize in your communities to build and entice, obviously, to speak to the purpose and history of the course, um, the rationale for the course, why it would be important um, for all students, even in predominantly white communities, to be um, engaging in this course. So very exciting, Renita, and a great question. Carmita, I think your question in regards to, has there been discussion about the course being required for all students? Yes, um, that is actually something that has been considered. And I think legislatively, if you recall June of 2019, when this um, you know, was passed, we had just come off of the new graduation requirements for the 2023 um, cohort. And so legislatively for them to then add on another <laughs> requirement, obviously for that, that cohort and beyond um, was just not, you know, again, judicious at that time. Do we possibly see something like that in the future? Going back to Gladys's comments about a K-12 curriculum, I do see a lot of things in our future and on the horizon. Um, there was conversation in previous sessions about a future part two, an ECE course, an AP course, right? And so um, just very, very exciting about the potential and, and so many of you that are on, um, you know, the, the, the cutting edge and pioneering in these efforts with us um, is really what's going to make this possible. So thank you for those suggestions. 
Jim Carlson is asking, is today's presentation available to share with teachers who were unable to make um, today's session? Yes, it will be available. We will actually be archiving a recording of the session, the PowerPoint itself, and then we will have um, all of the Q&As from all four sessions um, available to everyone that will be posted on the website as well. So Wanda, I'm just gonna do one more check. I think we've answered the questions. I don't see any other raised hands at the moment. I think that is good. So Gladys, if you will please close out the session, thank you. Let me unmute myself, thank you. Okay, just to uh, show you the next steps that will be taken is that, or we have been taken is November 16th, we will be meeting with the State Board of Education Standards and Assessment Committee. They're gonna be reviewing uh, what we just kind of presented to you, a little glimpse of what we presented. They will have a much more uh, documentation um, and they're gonna be reviewing and providing us feedback. And then we should be uh, completing the document uh, by no mid-November. And then again, we will go back to the entire State Board of Education on December 2nd, and we will uh, present the entire document for their review and vote and approval. Um, but if you, you know, feel that you need to have more questions or want to know more information, the link of Connecticut Circus right here, please feel free. Uh, watch for our emails and other documentations. And, and if you have any questions or any concerns, please look at the contact information. Feel free to email us at any time and we'll be happy to answer your questions and your concern. So um, thank you for being here and thank you for your questions. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.